Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our very first devotional of the new school year. We are especially pleased to have all the new students here for the first time. We encourage you and all others to make devotionals a priority throughout your university experience. My name is Matthew Richardson, and I have been asked to conduct this devotional. Today, we are pleased that President Kevin J. Worthen and Sister Peggy Worthen will speak to us. The Worthens were raised in Price, Utah. Although they grew up only three blocks from each other, their three-year age difference meant that they never went to high school at the same time and didn't know each other very well. After President Worthen returned from serving a mission to Monterey, Mexico, and while both were attending the College of Eastern Utah, they met at a church dance, and the two soon began dating, and, well, the rest is history. The Worthens were married in the Provo, Utah LDS Temple. Brigham Young University, with its mission and ideals, has influenced and shaped much of President Worthen's life. He was fascinated with Cougar sports as a young man and then earned both his bachelor's degree in political science and a Juris Doctorate degree from BYU. After practicing law in Arizona, he began teaching in the J. Reuben Clark Law School in 1987 and served as dean of the law school from 2004 to 2008. President Worthen served as the Advancement Vice President for six years before becoming the 13th President of Brigham Young University on May 1, 2014. You can see why he describes himself as a BYU guy through and through. President Worthen is currently serving as an Area 70. President and Sister Worthen are the parents of two sons and a daughter, and they have three grandchildren. On a personal note, it is a pleasure to work with President Worthen, and there is no better representative of Brigham Young University and its mission than the Worthens. I am often tempted to create a t-shirt or a sign that says, Stay calm, the Worthens are here. <laughs> we will now have the opportunity from hearing from President and Sister Worthen. Welcome to the start of a new semester. To our students, we're so glad to have you here on campus. Our community comes alive in a new way because you are here. Most of our new students arrived two weeks ago. Many of them participated in what is now becoming a tradition, forming the Y at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. This is a wonderful symbolic reminder that you, the students, are the Y, meaning you are both the reason why we exist as a university, and for those with whom you interact, the embodiment of what BYU stands for. You represent the why wherever you go. I love this recent tradition. Now, there is another BYU tradition, one which began long before any of the students here were born. In 1924, students hiked up to the Block Y on Y Mountain. They dipped mattress stuffing into oil, placed the mattress balls around the edges of the Y, and lit them with torches they had carried up, up to the mountain thus lighting the Y for the very first time. Since that time, the Y has been lighted every year for homecoming, graduation, and other special events. Fortunately, the torch fires never spread to the rest of the mountain in the ensuing decades. <laughs> but by the 1980s, those involved decided not to tempt fate any longer, and the mattress balls and torches were replaced with a generator and a string of light bulbs stretched around the Y, making the Y brilliantly visible throughout the valley. This past summer, permanent lighting was literally cemented in place and new technology was installed to allow remote lighting, thereby ensuring that the, the, the tradition of lighting the Y will continue for years to come. Just as I hope the more recent tradition of forming the Y in Lavelle Edwards Stadium reminds you that you are the Y, I hope that the continuation of the longstanding tradition of lighting the Y reminds you of an invitation that I will give to each of you students today. Don't just light the why, let the why light you. What do I mean by that? Perhaps it can best be explained by the fam familiar story told by President James E. Faust. In the 1980s, prior to his becoming a member of the First Presidency, President Faust worked alongside many others to establish the BYU Jerusalem Center. In a 2005 General Conference address, President Faust recalled one historic meeting regarding the lease for the land on which the center was later built. Before this lease could be signed, 
President Ezra Taft Benson and Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, then president of BYU, agreed with the Israeli government on behalf of the church and the university not to proselyte in Israel. President Faust said, to our knowledge, the church and BYU have scrupulously and honorably kept that non-proselyting commitment. After the lease had been signed, however, one of our Israeli friends instantly remarked, oh, we know that you're not going to proselyte, but what are, you, what are you going to do about the light that is in their eyes? President Faust observed, he was referring to our students who were studying in Israel. In other words, he was referring to you. More than you may recognize, you carry with you a light, a light that others notice. You brought much of that light with you to BYU thanks to your parents, your friends, your teachers, and the good choices you have made in your life up until now. My invitation to you today is that you enhance that light during your experience at BYU, or more precisely, that you enhance that light because of your experience at BYU, that you let the why light you. How can you do that? Let me provide four suggestions confident that if you apply them, you will receive further individualized insights through personal revelation. First and most important, you need to realize the source of the light and the purpose for which it is given to you. The Lord clearly identified the source of the light in the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 93, verse 2. Said he, I am the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In the words of Doctrine and Covenants section 88, verse 13, he is the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, including what President Faust described as the light that shows in your countenance as well as in your eyes. The more our thoughts and actions align with his, the more we serve and love others as he does, the more his light will shine in us. If we take time each day to reflect on what Christ would have us do, he will use our experiences at BYU to enhance that light in us. The reason he provides that light to you is not just to help you, but also to help you help others. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Gaining light by your experiences at BYU will help you progress eternally and bring you peace and joy in this life. However, being lighted by the why is not a selfish endeavor. The light is not given you for your glory. It is to help others as they come to see the Lord through your actions. In the words of Elder Neil A. Maxwell, Brigham Young University seeks to improve and to sanctify itself for the sake of others, not for the praise of the world, but to serve the world better. When you accomplish something significant at BYU, which I hope happens often, think first of how what you have done can help others, not just how it might impress them. Maybe instead of bragging to your classmates about how well you did on an exam, you might humbly find ways to help them prepare for the next exam. If you do, you will increase their and your understanding of the subject. More importantly, you will in also increase their and your faith in the goodness of God and of His children. At the end of the day, Christ is the light which we are to hold up, that which we have seen Him do. How would Jesus react to doing well or poorly on an exam is a great question to ask ourselves if we want to be lighted by the why. The second suggestion flows from the first. As we recognize that Christ is the true source of the light, and as we remember that He desires His light to shine through us so that others may come unto Him, we can easily see that one way to increase the extent to which our experience at BYU lights us is by living our lives in a way that reflects His. Our mission statement challenges us to create, quote, an environment sustained by those moral virtues which characterize the life and teachings of the Son of God, close quote. That is one of the principal reasons for our honor code, to create an environment in which we are reminded of the kind of individuals and community we hope to become, a community reflecting the teachings of the Savior. In that regard, I call particular attention to our personal and collective commitment to treat with respect, dignity, and love all those with whom we interact, both on and off campus, including and especially those with whom we may disagree, even on very important matters. While others, perhaps well-intentioned, may deride us and our values, 
We must respond the way the Savior did, without compromising either eternal truths and values or the eternal reality that all human beings, our beloved spirit sons and daughters of heavenly parents, each with a divine nature and destiny. Our mission statement makes clear that, quote, all relationships within the BYU community should reflect devout love of God and a loving, genuine concern for the welfare of our neighbor, close quote. The light of the why will be most evident in your lives if you live in accordance with that charge and all the other principles of the honor code to which you have committed your integrity. There are other daily activities not expressly included in the honor code which can enhance the light of the why in your lives. Regular scripture study is one example. I was reminded of that truth by one of our football players a number of years ago. Brian Logan transferred to BYU in 2009 after two years at a junior college. I first met him shortly before the opening game of the season against then third-ranked Oklahoma. I quickly discovered that Brian was a person who was full of enthusiasm, energy, and a love of God. Though not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Brian fully embraced the opportunity to be a part of our covenant community, and he sought to influence others for good in that regard. He was also, by the way, a very good defensive back. This is a picture of Brian after the Oklahoma game, which BYU won. You can see what I mean about enthusiasm. Like you, I noticed that there was a message written on the eye black beneath his eyes. It was Philippians 4, 13. I must admit I didn't know off the top of my head what that scripture said, and in the excitement of the victory, I didn't have a chance to ask Brian. Later that night, I looked up the scripture. It reads, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I imagined in my own mind how this scripture provided Brian optimism in preparing for a game in which BYU was the, de was the decided underdog. As I attended the next game, I saw that Brian had again applied the eye black and that there was writing on it. I was at such a distance that I couldn't read the writing. So after the game, a resounding victory over an opponent we were expected to defeat, I approached Brian fully expecting that I would find the same scripture reference on the eye black, assuming that it was his favorite scripture. Much to my surprise, the writing referred to a different scripture, Luke 14, 11. Again, not knowing right off what that particular scripture said, I asked Brian. He quickly replied, For whoso whosoever exalteth himself shall be humbled, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I then asked him why the change in scripture references. He told me that as he read the scriptures each day, he would seek inspiration about what message God wanted him to focus on for the game that week. Against a highly ranked opponent the first week, it was the message of courage in Philippians 4.13. Against an opponent that some players might be tempted to overlook the following week, it was the message of humility found in Luke. For the rest of that season, I looked forward to my post-game interaction with Brian. I would grab him by the shoulder pads, look him straight on, and say, let me read your eyes. <laughs> in the ensuing weeks, I saw references to Proverbs 3.5, Isaiah 54.17, and other relevant scriptures, each reflecting personal inspiration that Brian had experienced as a result of his regular Bible study. One game, he even threw in one, a Book of Mormon scripture, maybe just for my sake. <laughs> I'm confident that many of you have had similar revelatory experiences as you regularly study the scriptures in light of your own personal circumstances. I invite all of you to do so. If you do, it will be reflected in your eyes, even if it is not written on eye black. I also urge you to engage in other activities that will invite the Spirit in your life, such as involvement in service opportunities through your ward or other organizations such as YSERV. As you seek to contribute to an environment that reflects those virtues which characterize the life and teachings of the Savior, your BYU experiences will create new light in you. Third, I urge you to discover and develop your talents and skills at BYU. This is one of the main purposes of this distinctive portion of your earth life. Your time at BYU is, as the mission statement says, to be a period of intensive learning. Such focused learning is designed in large part to help you acquire and enhance new knowledge, skills, and attributes. All of you have already discovered and refined many of your talents and gifts. You wouldn't be here if you had not. Let me suggest, however, that the Lord sent you here to BYU knowing that you could both discover new gifts and enhance those you already know about. 
In the, in the sermon at the temple where Christ in his visit to the Americas repeated many of the teachings he had provided in the Sermon on the Mount to those in the old world, the Savior repeated the essence of the commandment in Matthew that we are to be a light to the world. However, as my son recently pointed out to me, there is a slight but significant clarification in the message in 3 Nephi. In Matthew, the Lord states simply, ye are the light of the world. In 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 14, he says, I give unto you to be the light of this people. This sounds more like a gift, an opportunity, than a commandment. Like all divinely provided opportunities, it implies confidence in our abilities. God often gives us opportunities because he knows he has prepared us in ways we may not fully recognize or appreciate at the time. In that regard, the language the Savior uses in 3 Nephi, I give unto you, is instructively similar to that in the 46th section of the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord states that to every man and woman is given a gift by the Spirit. To some is given one, and to some is given another, that all may be profited thereby. God has given each of you individualized gifts to prepare you to contribute to his work in individual ways. God has given other people other individualized gifts so they can contribute in their own individual ways. When you apply these truths to this educational phase of your life, two things become apparent. First, you should search broadly to discover and develop all the gifts God has given you, lest you not accomplish all God wants you to do. We know from the scriptural promise in Doctrine and Covenants 46 that all of you have at least one gift, and I am confident that for all of you, the number can be multiplied many times. I'm also confident that you don't know all the talents you have, and the only way you can know that is to explore a variety of topics, which our general education requirement encourages you to do, and to take some chances in doing new things that may stretch you in new ways. Don't become so concerned with protecting your GPA that you miss out on one of the most exciting parts of your education, discovering and enhancing the gifts God gave you so that you can better serve him and his children. Second, because your gifts are individually tailored to you, don't measure your progress or importance by comparing yourself to others. Such comparisons will not only cause you to miss out on some of the important things you can learn from others, it will also interfere with your ability to develop product pr productive, joyful relationships with the many good people around you. If you view everyone as a potential competitor, you will soon find yourself surrounded by enemies. If you view those around you as guides who can help you learn, you will soon find yourself surrounded with friends. Fourth and finally, never underestimate the power your light can have on others. Let me illustrate with a reference to a lighthouse. All of us are familiar with lighthouses. They send out a beacon of light that can hopefully be seen in the worst weather. They mark the line where the sea ends and the land begins a very important marker for those who are piloting boats, especially in bad weather. But lighthouses also have another role to play for those who are piloting boats. In addition to marking the place where the sea ends and the land begins, lighthouses can, with the help of other lights, guide sailors through treacherous waters where reefs and other unseen barriers might sink the ship. In such situations, there is often only one safe passage to the harbor. And the only way the pilot knows the ship is in that passage is by maneuvering the ship so the light at the top of the lighthouse aligns with the carefully placed lights on the shore. Once the ship is in that position, it can proceed safely as long as those lights, the one in the lighthouse and the one on the shore, are in alignment with each other. If they are out of alignment, the ship is off course and there is considerable, considerable risk of a tragic shipwreck. One writer related the following true example. More than a hundred years ago, a well-known Protestant preacher, Dwight L. Moody, shared a story of a ship trying to enter the Cleveland Harbor on a very stormy night. The ship's captain could see the bright light of the Cleveland Harbor lighthouse. However, the lower lights weren't visible at all. The lower lights were the way that ships identified the center line of the safe entry to the harbor. Because the lower lights were not burning that night, the ship missed the entrance to the harbor and crashed into the rocks. Many lives were lost. At the end of his sermon, Reverend Moody said, the master will take care of the great lighthouse. Let us keep the lower lights burning. One of the members of Moody's congregation that day was a man named Philip Paul Bliss, a musician. 
Bliss was so inspired by the lesson in Moody's sermon that he wrote a hymn, which in our hymn book is entitled, Brightly Beams Our Father's Mercy. Many of you will be familiar with it. All of you should be. With the image of the lighthouse and this experience in mind, consider the message of that first verse of that hymn. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore, but to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. The lighthouse of God's love for his children is ever present and never moving. It is constant and always available. Some people will see it and will be drawn to it, but they may not know how to get to it. Your example may provide the lower lights they need to see the safe passage. More may depend on how you use your time at BYU than just your own well-being. The light you gain here may influence others for eternity. There is a remarkable promise in Doctrine and Covenants section 88, verse 67, a promise Elder Oaks once called the most significant promise ever given pertaining to education. It reads, And if your eye be single to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light and there shall be no darkness in you. And that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. I urge you to let the Y light you in such a way that you are filled with that light. You will then be successful not only in this particular educational endeavor, but also in the rest of your life. As I recently told the faculty and staff, and as I also recently told those at New Student Orientation, I now say to you all, you are not here by accident. God has a work to perform through you. Make Him the center of your efforts. Do what He would want you to do. Let His light shine more brightly through you as a result of your experiences at BYU. If you do, miracles will happen in your life, and you will see the majesty of the Lord work in the lives of others. May you realize this blessing. May the light in you shine more brilliantly because of what you do at BYU is my prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.